All right. So uh, let's see, verifying the recording is going. So in class today, we are going to stay, we're going to recenter ourselves back towards Arduino. We're going to do inputs, which is 13.1. Our unit numbers essentially mean nothing at this point. Uh, I deeply apologize. I'm in the midst of putting together a real honest to goodness schedule for the rest of the class so that you can sort of see where we're going and, and what's happening. We're also thinking about building in a couple of wildcard weeks. So stay posted for that. They'd be ways to focus your effort in, in the place that's best for you individually. Um, but for this week, we're gonna focus on inputs, which is adding senses to your electronics, which is hopefully going to be an exciting way to expand your horizons. Um, and then if we're generally talking about inputs, there are many, many, many ways that we can have inputs. These are adding, these are the, the ways that an Arduino would know about its world. Um, and let's see, the chat is already lighting up. Yeah, there's, um, the, we can also see what sort of different things can be made. Like the, the knitting machine got brought up. What sort of things can you sense and tell what's going on? Like the, the knitting machine actually at Makehaven, let me pull that up. Um, we're going we're gonna to talk about many things where we go through that. I think the knitting machine actually doesn't have much sensing. If we go to Makehaven equipment lists, uh, but it is up and running, isn't it? Does anybody know more about the knitting machine? I just meant for wildcard week. Uh, oh that, yeah. That's, that's all Denise. Denise um, is our wonderful new facilitator who got it up and got it running and it is uh, more coming soon. Yes. There's, it's a very exciting option. There's, there's tons of equipment that is on there. You may have rolled through here and seen things that you wanted to look at, but we didn't get it to. Like we did, we did not do um, screen printing or there wasn't really time to slide it in our, our 2D section. But if you're interested in screen printing, that could be a great thing to do during wildcard week. If you want to get caught up on a website, that, that would be another great thing to do during wildcard week. There's a ton of different options. And so I've just wanted to float that that's an idea that, that we're having. We're going to come into where we're going. But yeah, we're going to do inputs and outputs for right now. And then probably we're going we're gonna to give you some heads up time so that you know when that's coming instead of just randomly springing it on you. But all of these different tools, when you, when you look at these tools that I'm just rolling through, lots of them do different things. Not a whole lot of them have inputs. Uh, and when you think about sort of what an input is, a lot of these machines are, are in the category of, of not smart machines. We're going to call them that, uh, which is different from, from maybe this one, like the spot thermal camera. It has a sensor on its front end, an input where it can pull in information from the world. And like the microphone here is another one that has a sensor, but like a Sawzall doesn't, it doesn't know that it's cutting something or that it's not, it is very low sense of what's going on. Uh, not every machine does. So what we're gonna be talking about today is how do you do that and what are the different options to add sensation to your projects? And so there are, there are many, many ways that, ma that machines can sense their environment. We're just gonna list off 25 of the most common of those. We're gonna go over the core concept that's at the heart of a lot of them which is the voltage divider. We're gonna talk about six essential inputs, six core things that you absolutely should know about um, because they, they form the basis for lots of different pieces and parts. Then we're gonna talk about chip to chip communication, which is another interesting topic, could be its own whole unit all on top of itself. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the saw stop is a good example of a machine that does have a sensor. And so the, the saw stop has a really good and important sensor because it'll stop the saw blade on its own uh, if it notices any, any little milli voltage from hopefully not a finger, but could, could be a finger. Um, and then our last topic will be the multi-input uh, path. So what do you do if you wanna have multiple things as inputs to your sensor? So there's all sorts of different sensors we're going to go for these 25 common ones. And these are by no means a complete list, but it is a good start for what's going on. We're going to, I've, I've got five major categories here. We've got switches and everything in the leftmost column is a switch. 
The variable resistor column, those are all just resistors that change their resistance. The middle are semiconductors or pretty much semiconductors. And then there's the complicated ones on the right hand side. So I guess maybe four categories, but these are all different types of inputs that you can have. And there, I would say essentially, if you want to understand inputs, there's three different levels. Knowing that they exist is really important. Knowing how to like implement them, how to use them sort of conceptually what they're about. And then the last bit is how do you write the software? So understanding all of these different types of sensors is really helpful. Um, we can go through all of them. This, this first bit is our toggles. Those are like the flippy switches that you'd see that have a satisfying click to them usually. Limit switches, you might have seen, these are micro switches. They show up a lot in pinball machines, but they also are the end stops on 3D printers usually. Push buttons are like the buttons on a keyboard or the, the buttons on a video game controller or arcade, uh, arcade game. Read switches are magnetic switches. So if you have a magnet that can trip a switch, usually a read switch, the blue ones are the ones that we're gonna go over. So push buttons, potentiometers, light dependent resistors, PIR motion, capacitive touch and real-time clocks. Those are all the ones that we're gonna sort through. Encoders, we're not gonna go in a little, we're not gonna go deeper here. We're just gonna leave those as they are. They're actually fairly complicated even though they made it onto the, the like learning board. Thermistors, we haven't seen at all. Those are, those change, the name is sort of giving it away. They're resistors that change with therms or temperature. Uh, there's flex resistors, which are really cool when they bend their resistance changes. Load cells are what your bathroom scale uses. Phototransistors are sort of like light dependent resistors, but they're semiconductors at their core. So a little bit more efficient. Hall effect sensors are kind of like a reed switch. They're magnetically activated things. Um, yeah, load cells are the liars is totally the right <laughs> interpretation for those. Uh, microphones, these are MEMS microphones or Electrap microphones. It's a subcategory of all the different types of microphones. PIR motion we'll get into, but those can see things moving. Time of flight distance sensors. And there's a few different categories for these, but I was thinking specifically about light based time of flight. And then there's all these complicated ones. Like GPS is a sensor that you can reasonably add to an Arduino project. There's little GPS modules. They're kind of expensive, um, but they, they're basically radio antennas that are listening to all the GPS satellites that we've put up in space. So they're really good at telling you accurately the time. And if you can get time from at least three of them, but up to like seven or eight uh, at the same instant, you can use the difference in the time that they're reporting based on how far away they are to triangulate in space your position on the planet, which is wild uh, that that's how that works. That really you're just listening to the clock signal come down from those satellites and then using the difference in clocks to figure out where you are. Sonar and LIDAR are really cool. There's RGB color sensing, which Kate has uh, did with that camera a couple weeks ago, last week, a couple weeks ago. That was a really cool project. It also can be done with a with its own signal single chip. This is sort of the the holy grail, uh, the nine degree of freedom sensor, the accelerometer, gyrometer, magnetometer. Your cell phone has one of these in it. And as of right now, this if you know how to write code well to manage these inputs, you can get a job doing just that. Uh, they have entire like I found entire two hour long lectures where it's like a master class and how to write code that deals with the quarter, quarter nions uh, that you need to deal with all of this. There's some really advanced uh, trippy math and code that happens with those, but they're also really cool. You can tell which way is down. So, you know, that's helpful. Um, capacitive touch, this is a fun one. These are buttons like on your phone's touch screen. Gases, you can measure ethanol for like a breathalyzer or carbon monoxide is real important. Cameras, which are usually too much for an Arduino, but are a totally valid input for lots of electronics. Air pressure, which is neat. If you have a, a fancy watch, it might tell you what altitude you're at or what the weather is gonna be based on air pressure. Also, if you have a smart watch, most of those have a human pulse sensor or maybe even a pulse ox in them. It's the little green glowy light that, that shines down into your skin it's sensing things coming out of, out of your skin or through your skin. And then real-time clocks, we're gonna go into those. 
if you want a more complete list, here's the 2021 inputs list from Fab Academy. And they categorize them by like what they're measuring. So if you wanted to get all of these different pieces, there's like little videos on how some of them work uh, where you can see someone showing down and up or all sorts of weird stuff. So there's, there's a ton of different resources all linked here if you wanted a much larger than 25 list, but these are the ones that we're gonna stick to. Um, so as we do that, and as we think about inputs, one of the first things that we should do is think a little bit about sort of the electronics of it and how, how, do, how do you even do input sensing and input reading? Because one of the things that we deal with on a regular basis, but it may not be a thing that you regularly think about, is that we have uh, all of our electronics are pretty much digitally driven at this point, but we live inside of a world that is fundamentally not digital. You've got an analog world and analog electronics that predated all of the digital stuff. We've been using analog computers for hundreds of years to try and do astronomy sorts of things. Um, but digital electronics really showed up right around World War II and largely could be attributed to Alan Turing. It was one of his best parts of that innovation uh, to figure out how to crack codes and things during that war. But it really can take a noisy, messy symbol and simplify it. Um, and so in the yellow circle of analog electronics and voltage dividers, we're going to drill down a little bit deeper into things that have an analog to digital converter, which is the way that you go from a messy analog world to a digital signal in a, in a current situation. And then Arduino pins are specifically the analog pins are a little subcategory within those. They have analog to digital converters, although there are fancier ones that you can get. But, but essentially what this entire problem is dealing with is that in the real world, you'll have a signal that's like this over here, where your input from one computer to the next for any number of reasons is sort of noisy and choppy. But Alan Turing made the realization that like, if I put a cutoff threshold and say, if it's high enough, it counts as a one. And if it's low enough, it counts as a zero. And then I don't deal with the noise. I just let the noise be cut out then you can simplify and sort of purify that information. And as long as your, your computer system is able to split out and, and the ones register separately from the zeros, you can get digital information from a signal that is noisier and messier than just pure ones and zeros, which is a fascinating way to sort of simplify and clarify information that comes from the world. So this is the simplest analog to digital converter. This is a lot of math. I crammed it all onto one slide because this is not going to be where a lot of us live in our headspace. Um, if you want to know exactly how the voltage divider works, this is the equation right here. The output voltage of a divider comes from the five volt supply. It gets divided by these two resistors and you get some sort of an output. So from the equation shown on this input pin right here, some divided amount of the logic level comes through. And I don't, this is not a math exercise. I don't want to have us do that. But what I, I think is worth seeing is that if I have two resistors, resistor one and resistor two, the dynamic of those two resistors and how strong they are relative to each other changes my output. If I input five volts here and I've got a pairing that's 10,000 and 5,000, I would get 1.67 volts out. If they're evenly matched, I get two and a half out. It's, it's half of the original voltage. And if I have one resistor is 10,000 and another resistor is 20,000, I get a different voltage that comes out. But basically this voltage divider is a way that if I have a resistor that is fixed in value and another one that changes in value, this analog output pin is something that my Arduino can read and, and make sense of. So if the resistance of a photoresistor changes, and lots of you at this point have seen a photoresistor change its resistance. On the learning board, if you stuck your finger over the little photoresistor, you'd see that it could respond. And so if you do that, the resistance changes and the Arduino somehow knows how to cope with that. There's a lot of reading that you can do to go along with this. And I, I'm gonna put some links into the foundations chat after we're done here. Um, but this is a really interesting phenomenon. If you wanna go deeper into that, 
And if you don't, knowing how to hook things up right is really the only takeaway you need to have. So here's, here's the big thing. An analog to digital converter, what it does is it takes a voltage that could be any number of messy things. And like we saw in the first slide back here, if you go with the simplest one, it's either above or below a threshold. If it's above, if this little squiggly line is above, it's a one. If it's below, it's a zero. And that's the simplest setup. If you have a more complicated one, you might have four different categories. And so you might, if the voltage that you're observing is up here, you might see it as a three. If it's here, you see it as a two. If it's down in this band, you'd see it as a one. Over here, it might be a two again, and then a three. An analog to digital converter takes this weird, goofy line and turns it into a series of ratings, sort of splitting it up and deciding what is the voltage. And it doesn't give you back the voltage in a number. It gives you back a, a it doesn't give you back the voltage in volts. It gives you back the voltage in a rating or in, in a value because it has this different breakdown of how to read and interpret that. This is, yeah, it, so it's totally a weird thing. And here's the main takeaway that what you've got is your voltage is gonna shift around based on an input. So if you have light hitting something, uh, if you have light hitting a light dependent resistor, its resistance is gonna change and voltages will shift around. You can, do, you can figure that out by a voltage divider, which is interesting on its own. But when you're doing an analog read on an Arduino, you'll get an input that gives you some interesting things. It'll spit out values of zero to 10, 23. And it's worth it to hop over and look at the example of that happening just to make some sense of it. So let's take a look at this. Here we go. All right, just to see sort of what this looks like, I've got a few things hooked up here. This is an Arduino, it's running a few pieces of a very short code in block code. So it's doing a quick loop. And so we're gonna try and, and make sense of what's happening. In A0, I have a resistor that's tied in just straight to ground. So this is my ground rail right here. And I'm doing an analog read. And when I analog read on ground, it gives me zero as a result. So I've got zero right here. On A1, which is the second number, it's in the second column. It's five volts is what this resistor is tied to. So it's tied into five volts. And so what I'm getting as a reading is the top of the analog to digital converter for Arduino. And so instead of being able to tell me five volts, cause it, it can't do that. It, it doesn't handle decimals well. It's, it's just a tricky thing about um, Arduino and microcontrollers is they don't deal with decimals nicely. Um, but what it can do is tell me that it's the top of the rating for what it can measure for voltage. And since it measures it with a 10 bit ADC, the top of that rating is 1023. And then this one over here, I'm measuring actually off of A2, the third pin here, and then this is floating. And so you can see there's some chaos going over, going over here. This is where anytime it gives me a number like this that isn't zero or 1023, this is telling me that it, at those different points in time, it's got a different voltage that's at play. They're actually simulating this in Tinkercad and I'm pretty proud of them for putting in floating pins. Um, but this is an erratic thing that can happen where the voltages are jumping around, right? So as the voltages jump around, you'll have all sorts of different things happen. Um, and, and actually what I can do is stop the simulation, pull the code back and then hop in and do a photoresistor. If I put a photoresistor right here and then tie this into ground, this is basically one of those examples that I had just shown. Let's put this up to 10K. Um, and if I start the simulation again, pulling this here, I can click on this. And so watch that middle column. You can see it's different now, but if I change my amount of light, this is a little slider, this is bright and this is dark. If I change this slider here, you can see the number changes. And what that's doing is, is it's the Arduino is reading the voltage that's coming in between this light dependent resistor and this one that stays the same all the time. It's able to see that the voltage changes, but it can't tell me I've got a different voltage. It instead is using an ADC to tell me 
what the, the rating is on there. So if I go all the way up to here, I can get up to 969. So I'm not, I'm not quite at five volts. Um, and if I'm down over here, 86, I'm pretty low on the voltage scale. So that means that my voltage is pretty low. The, the good news is, is that a lot of this, you probably won't need to know the exact specifics, but an analog to digital converter lets it take a reading from a voltage divider and turn it into a number. And that number is then something you can respond to. Like I would be able to pretty easily say, well, I'd like my sketch to, if this is dark on the left, um, I could say, well, when it's dark enough, turn on the lights, right? That's, that's a very reasonable ask for a microcontroller. And so I would just need to watch this value. And maybe I'd say, well, if the value gets to be larger than a hundred, then I want you to turn on the nightlight. And if it gets lower than a hundred, turn off the nightlight. So you can start to do informed things based on your input values. This is for analog inputs. Um, for digital inputs, we'll see that it's a little bit different, but you can have your inputs act based on their states. And it's really important to understand that this is a voltage divider. And if you wanna drill down in the math, which is pretty fascinating if you're into that sort of thing, it is interesting to see how it corresponds to voltages and, and, and how it makes things go. And actually, if you understand that really well, if you really nail it on the voltage dividers and voltage outputs and, and whatever, here's an example of a little project that I made years ago. This is when I was just first dating Carolyn. I bought her this little necklace of oxytocin. It's, it's like the, it was sold on Think Geek as like the cuddle hormone which I thought was cute at the time. <laughs> she quickly informed me it's also a very common hormone when you're pregnant. And, and that was not the message I wanted to send, but you know. Um, in any case, this is a photoresistor. You can see it right here. And all I have is a single transistor underneath there, not a microcontroller, not an Arduino. It's just this with a voltage divider tied to a transistor controlling an LED. And I did that so that I could close up the box and it could stay wrapped and closed for about a week before she was gonna open it. So voltage dividers are tricky. They're, they're definitely not an easy thing to, to get at first glance. I totally understand that, but understanding how to do them well can really unlock different levels of being able to make and think about your inputs and output, your import inputs and outputs, sorry. <laughs> Um, and so just trying to make sense of these graphs before we're totally done with them. In this case, this is a three bit ADC. So there's like three sections here. This is the voltage that it's reading over here on the left and the, the numbers are what the ADC would read. Here's your same voltages, but with a five bit ADC, I can go anywhere between zero and 15, it doubles the accuracy each time you add a bit. And so I can have bigger numbers. The Arduino is a 10-bit ADC, which is why it goes all the way from zero to 1023. So it is definitely confusing at the start. The good news is, is that you won't need to know the ins and outs of those hardcore electronics pieces at the beginning. But it, it's, again, one of the things that you can go way deeper with if you're fascinated by it. So that said, that's sort of the, the esoteric background. Let's keep on moving. These are our six essential pieces and they're just a start. So we're just gonna use this as a springboard to get going. And from there, uh, there's a lot more to unpack. But first up is the light dependent resistor. So this is the setup that you just saw me playing with, um, with a light dependent resistor here and a resistor there. Basically, if you set up this arrangement with a resistor and a photoresistor, the voltage on this pin will shift around and an analog read on an Arduino would give you different numbers. By reading that analog read value, you could set a threshold and it's darker than this. I'd like you to turn on a nightlight. If it's brighter than this, I'd like you to turn off the nightlight or any number of things. You could, you could do all sorts of stuff. As the states change, you can make all sorts of things happen. Another essential piece um, is the button. People love the button, love to use buttons. There's all sorts of great reasons for buttons. We intuitively get what a button is uh, and there's a few ways to hook them up. Buttons are really great. They're trickier than you might think. I've actually got a couple of things linked um, that I'm going to link 
in the foundations chat so that you can play with this. Assignments that I used to give to high schoolers to really drill down on the, the nuts and bolts of a button because they're, they're awesome and easy to understand from an end user standpoint, but there, there are some tricks to getting them to work that, that we're gonna talk about in a little bit, but they're really cool. Also, these, these also fall into inverted logic or standard logic, just like we saw with LEDs, depending on how you stabilize them. And so we're going to take another look at that. When you're thinking about buttons, an important thing, an important topic comes up. Uh, buttons make and break electrical contacts. And so as you're doing that, you need to think carefully about how you're going to make or break your contacts. And so the big thing is that you don't wanna let a pin float when you're putting a button in. So if you have a button like this, you'd wire it up between five volts and your input pin. These you can analog read, but you can also digital read. So digital read is the, the tool that you'd use to grab these. And when you press the button, it might be obvious that it's connected to five volts. It gives you a high reading, but you also need to think about what happens with the button when you're not pressing it. Because if, if you didn't have this little resistor here, the digital pin wouldn't be connected to anything. It would just be floating, which as nice as floating looks like with this boat over here and on a snowy day like today, I, I want a boat like that in my life. Um, floating is not a good thing. You don't want to think about this kind of floating when we talk about electronics floating. It's more like tsunami block print floating um, where things get random and, and wild and weird. So. This is another one that it's worth it to play around with. I'm going to push out an example sketch where you play with some floating pins. And the example that we had pulled up in here, whoops, if I get out of this slide, this is a floating pin. So you can see all the randomness that's happening here. If you want to have a consistently behaving set of electronics, you don't want this sort of chaos, right? This is what you get if you have a floating pin and you'd rather most of the time for things to be stable. So you wanna always have a resistor that stabilizes your unpressed button state. So if you do standard logic, just like this, in this particular configuration, if you have a pull down resistor, when you press the button, this pin is going to read high. If you do a digital read, it would read high. And when it's unpressed, it would read low. If you didn't, if you omit that resistor, if you don't have a connection there between ground and the input with a resistor, then you're gonna have a random floating input and if you're doing important things, when, you, when the button press happens or doesn't, then you've gotta be careful about sort of the logistics of what's going on because it, it, will, do, it will do random actions. Um, this one doesn't have a particular algebraic equation for this, this, this one thing. I was just seeing a question. I might be a little late on that game. Um, but in here, you wanna make sure that this resistor is added. Now it doesn't actually need to be pulled down. I just like this logic because it's easy. When you press the button, it gives you a one. And if it's not pressed, it's a zero. And that's nice and straightforward. If you wanted to, you can do this configuration where it's inverted logic. And when you press the button, it goes to ground. And when you're not pressing the button, it goes to high, it goes to one, which, which sure you could do that. I almost never will wire a button that way. But what I will do is if you have a button, but you don't have a resistor for some reason, you can use a built-in part of a microcontroller. So inside of the Arduino's core chip, there are actually pull-up resistors built into it. You just need to activate it with code by typing in input pull-up, which I guess I've partially obscured there in the slide. So if you type in input pull-up, instead of uh, setting it up as just an input, you can leverage resistors that are built into the Arduino because this is such a common problem. So both, mostly you want to avoid floating if you possibly can. There's a lot of things to, to play to play with there. Let's see, I got a question. Hey, Corey. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, that was my question. It was just I, like, I can't visually understand or see how um, the, it's pulling down anything because there's a gap between the voltage and the resistor. So how does it yeah, no, that's, unless a, that's I'm not a good thinking question. about it the right way. Um, so here's so let's think about this uh, with the unpressed situation first. So if I'm 
imagine like sitting here and trying to ask, what am I most directly connected to, right? If you're, if you imagine this is a big resistor with a large resistance value, and this button is kind of like connecting a wire when it's pressed. So there's almost no resistance, maybe one ohm of resistance total. Uh, when the button's pressed, you're most directly connected to five volts. So right. your, your input pin would read five volts. And that, that I think a lot of people get intuitively. The, the trickier part for me was what happens when this isn't pressed, which is actually right. how it's drawn. It's floating still. So, well, it's yeah. this, like this section right here is floating, but the input is tied through this big resistor to ground. So the resistor is linking this to ground so that its input actually reads that it's in the ground position. So like Got this it. resistor okay. right here is tying this pin to ground and it's, it's going to, it's going to read out zero all the time. But, but the voltage in, in terms of just, let's say just safety, let's say there is a lot of voltage there. Mm -hmm. It's still floating. The only thing that's actually grounded is the input, but the voltage remains a floating voltage. Uh, so yeah, let me, let me tie up your language about that a little bit tighter. The five volts that you have at the top okay. is, is available. And what's, what could be floating is if, if I don't have a resistor here, this would have nothing that it's tied to. The five volts up there and the five volts or in the, and the zero volts down here, they, they are not, ex, they're not connected. Um, but then in that case, the, the button is not working like a button where it's connected. It actually works like a really terrible capacitor. And so it sort of stabilizes where the, the side that's labeled two on this button would be at zero volts and the side labeled one would be at five volts. And then they're not going anywhere. They're sort of stable in that state until you press the button down, hmm. which, which, is, which is tricky. Like you're, it doesn't let any current flow while the button's unpressed. And so this is just tied, connected to ground. And when you press that, it's got an easy, quick connection to five volts and it is, sort of disconnected here. But the floating is if this wasn't tied to anything. Actually, what's really cool is if you have an Arduino nearby and you do analog in out serial, um, like if you pull up that example sketch and I'm working on getting it open. So wait, what's happening on the five volt side though? Oh, it's just not being used. It's just stable there. There's, it, it will sit there just fine. So the five volts here are just not being used. They might be used somewhere else, but it's not leaking. It's not going anywhere, or it's hopefully not leaking. Um, the big thing is that when you have, when you read your sensor pin, you want to have it have something stable to grab onto. If you don't have a pull down resistor, it's right. going to just like randomly grab at things. And, and okay. it doesn't take a lot of electric charge to make that go. Here, I've got a picture of a, a person with long hair who's rubbing it against a balloon. Just a few extra electrons can make a floating pin go high or low randomly, which is why you get such erratic behavior. It's, it's definitely a weird point, um, but essentially those input pins are very tiny capacitors also, and just a little bit of charge this way or that, and you can have a problem. It's why a pull down resistor stabilizes them and gives them a, a nice consistent working, a nice consistent behavior pattern. So you absolutely okay. need to think about how to tie your pins to ground or five volts so that it's stable. We use a 10K value just so it's not passing a lot of current. You're not draining much energy that way. It just stabilizes it without a big um, energy cost. It's, I, I will definitely find an article and, and post some more info on this. Um, next up, potentiometer. This is another one. We've played with these. On the learning board, there's, there's definitely potentiometers. And this is a video that um, I really like that opens them up and shows it. If you get a chance to play with these slides and go onto YouTube, you can watch this whole thing. And they talk about how really it's just one big resistor and the middle pin is touching it somewhere. It's short circuiting it, short, sh short circuiting it. Sorry, it is short circuiting the resistor in a way that you have 
different resistances between the two sides. So this is an interesting way that you can make an output that'll go across the entire range of analog read. It'll go all the way from zero to 1023. So if you wanna have very fine tuned control on something, or I use a lot of potentiometers, if I wanna adjust a setting on the fly without having to edit code, I'll add in a potentiometer knob so that I can change that and then not have to worry about how, how to reprogram something. I can just turn a knob and, it, and it'll shift around. These are a neat tool that are definitely worth it playing with so that you feel like you can totally understand them. Uh, and, and 10K potentiometers, that's really the resistance from pin one to pin three. Pin two is gonna have resistances that are different and relative. The video does a great job explaining that. I would totally recommend watching. Let's see, click on to the next slide just to keep track of time. The PIR motion sensor, this is our fourth, I would say essential uh, sensor. And this was a little contentious to choose this one, um, but it's a neat one just because it's got the ability to do um, a really useful thing. It can, it's sort of like a little bug eye and it can see infrared motion changing going from one section to the other. So this is really common to have on like garage doors where there's lights so that you can see if there's motion. These are the classic motion sensors. Like if you have a bathroom that you walk in and the light turns on and then a couple minutes later, the light turns off. This is the sensor that's doing it. They don't always look like a dome. Uh, sometimes they're that little curve shape on a standard bathroom door light. But this is, this is something that's going on. You can see it's a breakout board and it's actually got some potentiometers on it usually. So you can adjust some settings good use case for a potentiometer. Um, but these are more complicated inputs. There's a lot that's happening here. You can see there's some pieces soldered through. There's a, it's got its own chip to help with the sensing. But these are really neat to think about for Arduinos as inputs because they're almost always wired the same way. And they give you a digital out. So here you can see in my example, I've got it wired up to pin four. And so on pin four, you're able to just look at is the value high or is it low? And it, it might be that if the pin reads high, then the sensor seeing motion. And if the pin reads low, then it's not seeing motion, which is really actually very useful. Uh, it's a good way to control what's going on with lights in, in all sorts of scenarios. But then there's other reasons to use them also. Like maybe when the motion sensor turns on, you turn on a camera. Uh, if you're doing, I, I really love when the National Park Service puts out those game cameras and they can watch like watch mountain lions go by and the camera just turns on when there's a mountain lion in view or like a, I don't know, beaver or a, a, a hawk or something. These are really interesting and useful sensors that are, that are totally worth exploring because implementing them is much simpler because of all of this stuff that's usually pre-built for you. So it's a cool one to explore. The fifth sensor that we're gonna look at is capacitive touch. And this is a lot like a button. Uh, I've got this one, it's gonna play without any music or without any sound, but these are little metal strips and that's really all they are. Capacitors are really interesting electronic components that we don't, we don't need to know too much about to get started with Arduino, but they hold electric charge. And so Arduinos don't often use them, but in this case, they're really neat. You can use a capacitor and they're really bad capacitors that we're talking about here um, and, and very large value resistors. Basically the Arduino will try to charge up the, the little sheet of metal with a charge and it times it for how long it takes for it to get all the way charged. That's why it takes two pins to make this work. And so it, it starts to charge this little pad and then it times it for how long does that take? And it varies based on the environment. So when, you touch it, the reason why this works is because you are also pretty good at conducting electricity. So you make that strip a better capacitor when you touch it, which is fascinating. Um, it means that you can sense whether you're touching it or not based on how long it takes to charge. That's kind of what the times are that it's listing here. Those are microseconds it takes to charge. And when you touch it, that time goes up pretty significantly. So you can use that just as a basis for an input to control different things. And this seems maybe esoteric, but it's a button that won't ever break because there's no moving parts. And it's at the core of touchscreen on all of our cell phones and, and touchscreen devices for almost all of them. 
in your screen, there's a little set of micro wires that are basically running this exact same thing. Instead of being, you know, the half inch wide copper strips, they're very fine wires and it can sense where your fingers are or if there's multi-touch, how that's going. It's got a series of them that it's constantly pulling and always looking to see if there's a finger there that increases the capacitance and thus is touching the screen, which is, which is really interesting. This is super useful all the time. Uh, and it's, it's also from Paul Stoffergen, who's an absolute Arduino pro. If you haven't run across his stuff yet, you absolutely should check this out. Paul it's a fun way to add um, the ability to sense things. Also, you don't have to touch it. You can get really close. Uh, you can sense, depending on the resistor you choose, you can actually sense things fairly far away. So that's neat. Um, let's see. And then number six, this is uh, Paul Stoffergen. Yeah, I need to, let's get his name up on screen. Paul, S-T-O-F-F-R-E-G-E-N. I probably said that very wrong. I'm sorry to Paul. All right, uh, so here's our last one. This is a real-time clock. And so this is a module. It's basically based around these chips right here. The Arduino has a clock in it that can keep track of time. And time is something that's often really important to us for a lot of different reasons. But keeping track of time on an Arduino is, is good, but after even if you do it in the, the most rigorous way, it's gonna run out of sync eventually. Uh, if you use an unsigned long, that only will really last for maybe a month if you're keeping track of your milliseconds that way. And then it has to roll back over. There's a bunch of different, and, and the crystal on an Arduino is good, but it's not perfect. These real-time clock modules are accurate to as just as much as any you know, regular old wristwatch, the digital watches that, that dominated the 80s and the 90s. So a digital watch like this is essentially based around one of these chips. And these breakouts often come with a battery that will, keep the, that will help them keep accurate time for years. Even if the Arduino project is unplugged, you will have to go to the effort of programming them once to program the time. But then if the battery stays connected continuously, this module will be able to spit out the time without any difficulty for years on end. Um, another thing that's really helpful, especially when you get to this level, this is, you can see there's a lot more wires connecting this. This is gonna be communicating to the Arduino through a communication protocol, which we're gonna talk about in just a second. Um, but those communication protocols can really unlock some more advanced sensors like the nine degrees of freedom sensor. But those, those sensors and those communication protocols, the good news is you'll probably never need to learn the actual like ones and zeros of that. I've got some things that I'm going to share uh, that are coming up in a slide or two where you could learn those ones and zeros if you wanted, but usually there'll always be a library that will help you do this. So you don't need to learn the, the ins and outs of exactly what that is. You can use someone like Paul Stoffergen's work and derive your things from it. So there's, there's tons of opportunity to really expand your horizons quickly by leveraging breakouts and libraries to, to grow your Arduino project. And you've probably seen that already. It's just choosing the ones that you wanna try and explore. So, uh, stop, yeah, Stoffergen. I need to figure out how to say that correctly. But chip-to-chip -chip protocols. So here's three protocols that really work well to communicate between one chip and another. I squared C is how you'd pronounce this first one. SPI and TDI are three really common ones. I squared C, I squared C and SPI are good for chip to chip. FTDI is more like a USB sort of protocol for computer to chip. And then there's also bit banging, which is the, the name for a software only protocol. I squared C and SPI usually have dedicated hardware inside the Arduino chip itself. And so there's some hardware optimization Bit banging is when you write your own protocol and you can totally do that. If you wanna have a whole collection of things communicate back and forth, you can make your own protocol, um, but usually it's easier to just use one that exists already. So learning these is not something that you're going to need to do to be a successful maker with Arduino. But if you're interested, SparkFun has a fantastic series of, of articles that cover binary, they cover FTDI, SPI, and I squared C. Uh, they do all sorts of interesting things with this, and they really do a nice job of explaining it. Communication back and forth chip to chip is really good, but when you're having multiple chips, the one thing that you have to be careful about is the logic levels. We've talked about those before, 
Arduinos run with uh, high as five volts and something like a Raspberry Pi runs with high being 3.3 volts. Some of these sensors will go back and forth like the PIR sensor. It has a three volt DC regulator on this board. Everything internal here really runs at three volts but it communicates back with your Arduino at five volts. So they've, they've like taken that into account already on this board. It's just worth checking to see if you wanna add in a sensor, sort of finding through its information, what's the voltage that it runs at. Uh, and if you're following instructions, they've probably done that for you. But if you wanted to integrate your own, it's really good to just quickly look that up. It'll probably be described in what's going on there. If it's meant to be for Raspberry Pi, it's probably 3.3. And if it's meant to be used with Arduino, it's probably five volts. So it's worth looking at those just to make sure that you're not mismatching. An Arduino listening to an, a Raspberry Pi sensor might work, um, which, is, which is fine, but can also be frustrating if it kind of works, but kind of doesn't. Uh, whereas the other way around, an Arduino sensor trying to be used by a Raspberry Pi probably won't get enough power to make happen. Uh, and so that, that can be frustrating. So definitely take, take some of that into account as you're looking at things. Now, there are a couple of tricks to think about, a few things to consider when you're looking at inputs and as you're trying to implement them. The first thing, time is tricky, especially for microcontrollers. There's a lot of weirdness to how time works with these things. And so the first thing I wanna look at is a, is a core piece that is often in a lot of different starting starting things, yeah, especially time in a pandemic. Um, in lots of starting sketches, you'll see a line that looks just like this one, delay 20 or delay 1000 or delay 500. Delay like this can be really hard to leverage and to think about inside of your programs. So these, when you have a delay in an Arduino sketch, especially if you're trying to read something continuously, when there's a line in your code that says delay 200 or delay 20, the Arduino is going to freeze itself for 20 microseconds, for 20 milliseconds, and it won't do anything. So it won't be sensing, it won't be turning lights on, it won't be turning lights off. If you have a delay line in your code, it doesn't do anything. And so that's a really important thing to keep in mind if you're trying to measure something that happens quickly, or if you've got to have precise timing to go with your um, NeoPixels, you want to be careful about putting delays into your example, into your programs, and be conscious about what they're doing. And that can definitely take a little while to master when and how to use them. If you're curious what that looks like, I would totally recommend you look at examples digital blink without delay to see what it looks like to blink an LED without delay being in there. Uh, there's some, some interesting strategies and actually Arduino libraries that are written by people like Paul Stafferton, those are always um, done without delay included because they don't want to accidentally tie up your sketch. So unless they have to, they absolutely will do blink without delay. Oh, uh, and so usually there's some context to this. It'll be good to think about when and how you want to use those, use delay. The other thing that's really important, and especially as you're thinking about implementing buttons, is that buttons have their own weirdnesses. So I've got two, two lessons linked right here. You can open them up and take a look at them if you want. I'm just gonna, just gonna pull them up. Uh, these are things that I have actually given to students before who are trying to think about how to implement a button. There's some guidance, some hookup advice, uh, talks a little bit about bouncing and, and delay and all those different pieces. But those are all interesting things to think about as you're trying to put in a button in a circuit, they're super common. So everybody I think should try and figure out the, the vagaries of a button. Um, they're intuitively simple to use, but they're not always as easy to implement. I love these five pictures of buttons because they're buttons cut in half. Um, this is a micro switch where you can sort of start to think about how does this thing work, right? A 3D printer might reach the end of its little range and then it hits this thing. And if you look at the 3D printers in Maycaven, they've all got switches like this on their limits. And so it does that, that lever presses down on this button, which sort of squishes this spring here. And when that spring gets squished, this little metal guy goes from being connected to this top one to being connected to that bottom one. So this is a common pin. This is the normally closed pin and this is the normally open pin. It's a really interesting way to think about how buttons work. 
on their, on their most intricate little levels. And not every button is the same. This is a button that's cut in half and those little dots are actually a spring. That's like the coil of a spring that was cut in half. And when you press on this red piece, that, that is gonna make contact between these two pins here. Or this is like the little push buttons that made it onto the example board. When you push on the top thing, it connects this little thin plate to those two sides. Or here's another spring on a ball bearing. That ball bearing is gonna teeter this little lever piece back and forth. And here's another little switch that's sort of spring those things together. It's, it's fascinating to think about how buttons work on their mechanical level to go along with their code level. There's a lot of interesting things to think about. And actually keyboards take advantage of the fact that they have a moment where they make contact and they break contact. So when you go from being not pressed, so let's say you're at zero and then being pressed, you go up to five volts. A keyboard, when you press down on a key, like your, your L key, it'll send to the computer the button pressed and it sends another command for button released. So you can type long strings of letters by just holding the key down. Another thing that a keyboard has to think about is a, is a bounce. So when you press a key, there's like the instant just before or just after it makes contact, you'll have a sort of like sparking. And I'm not, not like a big spark that would be dangerous, but like a little hairy, not quite, but kind of in contact. If you do a button uh, action, a bounce like this can lead to many presses in the act of pressing and unpressing a button. And so there's actually some strategies in Arduino called debouncing where you'd wanna take this into account where you say like, okay, my state changed, let's wait 10 milliseconds and see if it's still the same to try and figure out, was it a bounce? Was it not a bounce? How does that work? Um, that's all laid out here in, in this momentary button part two, where you think about state change direction and debouncing. So there's all sorts of interesting things to think about when you're implementing a button. Uh, Luckily that's all handled for us in keyboard so we don't have to worry about it, but it is a neat one to consider if you really wanna drill down and you're, you're confident that you wanna add buttons to your projects. So trying to figure out the logistics of buttons and, and really write your own code for that would be a useful, a useful thing for this week. So then what, it, what is next? What's the goal for this week is really an interesting thing to explore and it's nice and simple, measure something. The goal this week is not like we've, we've done things like this before. We've done some Arduino stuff. Uh, but at this point you've played with Arduino, you've done some projects, you've got a little bit of background in it. You've written some code. Uh, you've made sense of those things. We were building up an empire of skills and now it's time to leverage them. So it's really valuable as you start to think about how would you want to generate your own ideas for building circuits and generate your own different creations. It's really important to have implemented your own input. So to have figured out how would you wire it? How would you get code for it to work? And so the charge this week is just to set up an input that's new to you. Or if you're really feeling ambitious, try two of them. Drill deep in how it works. Make sure that you feel like an expert in that one thing so that if you ever, have a realization like, oh, I would really like to make a night light. You're absolutely confident that you can use a light sensor to make that happen. Or if you want to make an alarm that will that will go off when someone walks by, or if you want to use um, a, a button to dispense dog treats or whatever it is you might be interested in, the goal this week is to try and figure out how to measure something. And And this is, it's a sneaky one, right? It's a little bit tricky. But when you start to add in all of the different pieces of this menu, when you, when you think about all of the sensors that are in this list of 25, or even the more complete list from, from Fab Academy, you can start to imagine like, how does this work? And, and all of these become options for different ways that you can start to think about it. And the first step is to know that those sensors exist. And then once you've got that, the next step is to think about how would you wanna implement it? Like conceptually, what does it do? And then what's a good use for it? And then the third example, the third step is how do you write your code, uh, right? Because there's, there's a lot of things that can be done that are not too complicated. Like an LED right here is, is an output. This is, <laughs> it's an output example. But if we're going for um, 
like for let's let's find a good one, like a Hall effect sensor, right? This is a little chip. It's very tiny. This is super duper small. Um, but all that this thing does is it's a sensor. Let's find its data sheet. Let's see. There's the data sheet for it. So we're downloading this data sheet for a Hall effect sensor. All that this thing does is it um, it will output a voltage proportional to magnetic flux density. And so that's a really complicated thing to try and make sense of on first glance. But what this has turned into is that if I know how to do this, I can take and use, use a Hall effect sensor and um, make a Hall effect encoder. So if, like, if you essentially know how those things work, and then you want to use it in creative ways, you could use it in, a, in conjunction with a motor and use the Hall effect sensor to try and find a way to measure how much a motor has spun. So you can use these to, and I'm pulling up different ones. Here's examples that people have made where they put Hall effect sensors right on the back ends of motors and they can actually track how much the motor has spun. And these are really helpful. Here they even put a motor right on it and then you can see this is a Hall effect sensor and that's a Hall effect sensor. So they can measure exactly how much that motor has spun just because they have two Hall effect sensors tied on there. So there's some effect if you need to know that a Hall effect sensor exists, you need to know generally how to implement it in code. And then like conceptually, how would you use that as a way to track how much something moves and rotates? This may seem like a weird use case, but it's actually really helpful. If we, the last um, CNC that I used was a ShopBot. And on the ShopBot, they do have motors with, with encoders on them. So they could tell sort of if they've jammed or if things have, have broken. So there's lots of different, and boy, there's a lot of weird attachments for them. Um, but in, in these different spaces, once you start to get the core of how these little sensors work, you can start to imagine more and more complicated applications for them. So that's the real reason why I want you to try and take this week and really drill down into the lowest levels of how do you measure something? Because from there, you're gonna open up the, these sensors as, as more of a tool set for how you would do more interesting things as you get a better sense for what and how they measure and how those all fit together. So that I think is, is actually gonna be that's probably it for my little spiel. Um, there's a lot to talk about, a lot of things that have happened over the course of the week, including that we're all sort of blizzarded in right now. Uh, and there's some questions that are coming through on the, on the chat. Oh, there's a, there's a good suggestion. Kate, I love, I love that question to everybody. Have you seen alarm clocks that when you walk away, get louder and louder as you go? Uh, is that a thing that you know about? Would you like to to share? <laughs> it's it's just an existing thing that there's an alarm clock and it has little feet on it. And so if you don't turn it off, it starts moving away. So you can't reach it from bed and it gets louder and louder. <laughs> yeah, that sounds that sounds terrible, actually. And and wonderful. What a fun, what a fun little piece. The no snooze alarm. Yeah, no snooze at all. I'm a big snooze fan. It's bad. So I'm having a hard time like getting the the bigger picture of where I'm going. Mm -hmm. Like when you say measure something, I'm like mm. I, I was thinking I would just go to those those, you know, the, the second to last slide, but I'm I'm not I feel like I need to better understand. Or maybe if someone else has an idea that they're measuring or I don't know, it'd be helpful to me. Yeah, it's um me measure, measure or sense, I think is probably maybe, maybe I picked the word in that case, but measure or sense something like you should be thinking about, uh, I had, I had a, a project with some students a couple years ago where they needed to measure temperature, right? They had to from scratch, build themselves a thermometer, uh, a digital thermometer with an Arduino. And so they got a thermistor and then had to figure out how to calibrate it. And I'm, I'm not, I don't think that calibrating a sensor would be the thing to do this week, but if you wanted to, you could. Um, but just to be able to have a, an input that then you can get oriented in such a way that you could reliably make sense of the world based on that input. 
So imagining, like maybe you think you want to be able to measure the amount of light in a room. Like if, if you've done a lot of glowy projects or like Ruby has, is making those clouds, maybe she'll want to throw a light sensor on. So when it's really bright in the room, they're brighter. And when it's darker in the room, they're darker. And then a real time clock. So then it's when it's 8 p.m., they turn off. You know, those sorts of things that could be really practical just to scale your project a little bit to make it more um, available to sense its environment. I wonder if there's any like websites that have some common formulas. Like I know you and I went over um, the linear algebra equation, the equation of a line and slope of a line. And then you showed me the math function. Yeah. Um, and that the math function might be like, an easy segue into it or maybe not i don't know but um yeah no the, the, yeah, the um there's like if you're trying to do temperature specifically you could get a tmp 36 and this is if you wanted to implement one of these it's a very reasonable thing to do for the sake of the week um let's accept and proceed in here, I want to find their data sheet. So here's a TMP36. Oh, I need to share my screen, don't I? This is this is a thing that happens to teachers in 2021. Um, here's the TMP36, and so this is this is a temperature sensor. This is a little tiny chip. It's got three pins. You can buy them on Amazon. TMP36. It definitely know what I'm going for because this is my art, Amazon history. So if you wanted to, you could use some of these. Uh, I'm positive that we have them in Makehaven, but these are little temperature sensors and they're pretty high precision, but this is the data sheet for them. And so they do a really interesting thing where they give you 10 millivolts per Celsius degree as a scale factor. And so if you really wanted to, to get specific in measuring things, it's pretty reasonable to say, I'd like to have a temperature reading. You know, any, any thermostat has it. There's this data sheet is going to have all sorts of information for you, but in here you can see that like the the there's one of these graphs is going to be its temperature versus its voltage, and so output voltage and time. There's all sorts of different pieces. I'm looking for the right graph that will have exactly what we want. Um, but there's usually down in here. Here's functional descriptions offset voltage, output scaling, and then output voltage at 25 degrees Celsius. So in here, <clears throat> in here, you can see that it would be 250 millivolts or a quarter of a volt would be what it scales up with at 25 degrees Celsius. So these are usually good for like, and here's the equation that exactly describes this particular thing. So there's some interesting, if you wanted to get this technical with measuring something, you can absolutely do it. If you wanted to be a little bit more esoteric, like measuring light is actually pretty hard, but a light dependent resistor is another one that you can absolutely look at. Let's see, components 101, here's these. Um, and so these are resistors that change their resistance based on based on a light. That's I love that little GIF, but it, um, let's see. So in here, you can see all sorts of different ones. These are probably very similar to the ones that we that we bought. Oh, and here's a data sheet that goes along with it. So in here, this is the resistance. Um, looks like resistance as a function of illumination. So in here, you can see the resistance changes along with the illumination. And I have uh, FTC is, one FTC is 10.764 lumens. If you want to get mathy on this, you totally can. If you just want to play with an input and see how you can get something to respond based on inputs, that's also totally valid. So any, uh, any of those strike a chord with somebody? Anybody ever used an input and really enjoyed how it worked? Yeah? And the photoresistors are really fun. And if you read up on them and, you know, I learned <laughs> so much that a lot of stuff I forget and have to come back to because um, mm -hmm. I haven't really like had it embedded in my mind yet. But um, if I remember correctly, 
um, when the light hits it, it, the resistance goes down because the electrons are excited or they can cross some kind of path that was previously blocking them. Yeah. Like the, if memory serves, I have to go back and actually look at it. But um, yeah, they're all like, they all make sense when I like read about them, but they like, I know a lot of people are like overwhelmed. I'm, I'm still overwhelmed to tell you the truth, Yeah. but I feel like when I just take my time and like you said, like pick one thing and read up on it, it kind of lends itself to all the other sensors and resistors because they, they're kind of all the, the same thing. It's just like, yeah, like yeah, something makes electrons react and that's signaling something else to behave a certain way. But it, yeah, it's, it's confusing to me when I'm like looking at something and I'm seeing like these equations, but if it's like broken down for me, like piece by piece and it's like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And, and so just, just one is really a good place to go for this week. Just become an expert on one new sensor and you'll feel like you've accomplished a lot and that you're headed in a direction that, that really makes it go. It's taken years to build up knowledge, a knowledge base about many different inputs. And so it will take you years also. Don't, don't try and think that you're gonna make it happen in a week. That would, that would be too much. Um, but you can definitely start to make better sense of what each one of them does and how to implement them and how to really like master that that one of them so yeah any anybody else have good input thoughts or should we move on to show and tell i think um <clears throat> i have a lot of sensors in my apartment that i've used for my home assistant and it's interesting how like they can be so easy to use yeah. like so much thought went into making this like one sensor that I have that sits in some dirt and it's actually like five sensors uh, and it works beautifully. And there's an app like, so it's, it's sort of interesting to be like, well, how does it work? Like I haven't had to ask that question um, and conceptually understanding how it works is work. Um, mm -hmm. So I think to Jamie's point, like, you know, there's, there's stuff that you learn and then you have to come back to it. And then you're like, but wait, there's more, there's just like, it can be kind of overwhelming. So anyway, my, 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 point is um i have a lot of motion sensors for Ooh, lights and stuff yeah. and like maybe pir would be like a really easy thing to play around with and understand um, yeah and would be like very applicable so i think that one is really interesting because you can um i think on the back you can solder in um a photoresistor and then it will start to only sense things in the dark like when it's <laughs> Yeah, if you read up. Wow. On it. I, yeah, because I'm implementing that into the the alarm. Um, yeah, that's that's fascinating. Like onto the module, you put a photoresistor, or did you? Like, yeah, I, I would put them in tandem. I think I'd have, if it's dark enough, then use the PIR sensor. Exactly, and then yeah. I have one that is for the light, and um, I. On my website, I think actually I have it right here. It's this back part, and I, I think I you pull this part off of it, and um, there's the lens. Um, and then on this back part, I I think it's a. Can you hold it up? Part right here. I, up I, yeah, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, it's one of these, and I put the pins on, and then this way I can attach it to the hmm. photoresistor. Yeah. Um, That's I forget how I do it because I haven't played with it in about a month, but um, yeah. maybe that's when I'll read up on so that I can explain it better to you all next week. Sounds, that sounds uh, that's great. Um, and I did actually want to ask you, like coming back to that, um, mm -hmm. someone gave me a broken nest, which has the same thing in it here but it's on this circuit board and i'm really curious about what to do with components like if if they come on a broken broken circuit board and you want to reuse them um like do you have to find out which one it is and then like hook it up to different resistors and whatnot and make your own circuit board like how 
How does uh, one like reuse like really good components from broken things? That's a that's a fantastic question, and it's definitely a tricky one. There's um there's a video from Great Scott on YouTube that is titled "What Is Worth Desoldering," because it's it's pretty hard to get components like that off, not destroy them, and then have another place to put them where it's exactly what you want. So it's it's good to ask that question. Um, it's it's very worth it to like explore how they're implemented on a board like that. But my guess is that you would probably have a really hard time like getting that one module off and then putting it back somewhere else without without damaging it. Um, it's possible. Mm -hmm. It just is like artful desoldering. So right. Yeah. And it's not even worth leaving it on the circuit board and implementing it into a project in another it, way, maybe. I or... think it. Yeah, it would be hard. I don't know how much you could reprogram that board or, or do any of those things. It looks like Kate found exactly the video. Yeah, <laughs> it's a good one. Oh, cool. Thank you, Kate. For sure. Uh, I soldered a bunch of uh, jumper pins on a few boards. I still wasn't able to get it off. Uh, I spent a lot of time trying to get it. It's just the solder sticks so close to the board that you'd have to wiggle and break it off. Uh, I'm a little disappointed, but uh, they're pretty cheap, though the board so we're just get another one that's good and I'm I, know, I, I break them every time what was that yeah I, I well i tried to desolder like a few weeks ago like when we were doing those little circuit boards and it was it was really hard yeah, yeah. The, 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 the the needle nose doesn't really help either you know the the sharp point yeah. the um i tend to burn myself gun. a lot when i do it yeah <laughs> The hot air gun actually works pretty well for desoldering, better than other things. I think I was using it with Anna this past, yeah, or, and with Lila this past, I think I used it with both of you actually, um, to try and get things off. It, where it just heats it up and it, it can kind of melt the solder in an area, but then if you're that hot, you're also maybe melting the part. So, you know, you gotta be careful. <laughs> How long does it take? It just uh, once, once the thing is hot, it doesn't take too long. So oh, okay. just a couple of like less than a minute once the hot airflow is already hot. So. All right, let's let's show and tell everybody. This is the most exciting part. Uh, it's all and and there's all sorts of things that could have happened over the course of the week. Um, in general, we we're hoping that three dimensional things could have gone on. I have something small that I can show that I worked on, but I would love to see it if any of you have things that you want to show off? Should I go first? It's just Wogata pointing at me. Is that, is that what that was? Yeah. All right. Uh, here, I made a little laser cut thing from, so I put out a tutorial on how this works. These are slots that fit together um, that are cut out of mat board, but it would be, this is actually dimensioned so that those could be cut out of plywood and then it would be like a little love seat bench. So it's a little model of what a bench would be where those slot together. It's four across the main thing. There's some slop in it, but it's four across there and then across this way. Maybe when we're all done, we can make a bench to commemorate the first year of foundations. That sounds like fun. So yeah, that looks great. Thanks. Yeah, so there's that's one of many ways. You might've 3D printed this week. You might've just played around with CAD stuff uh, there's tons of options. So let's see what people made. Jamie and Wogata, you're both unmuted. Who wants to go? Um, go Either way. All right. So um, I posted in the Slack uh, the case I was making for the Raspberry Pi. So um, let me just go over to. Cool. So I imported this. I don't remember the website I imported it from, but um, you should be able to share your screen if you'd like to. Oh, um, yeah, not sharing, right? Hold on. Yeah, you're good. Okay, share screen. There we go. Now you all can see. Yes. Okay. Excellent. So uh, I don't know if Kate, do you remember? what website this could have been imported from because you tried this too? No? Oh, okay. Well, uh, so I did not create this. 
uh, but I did create uh, a case for it. So this is the bottom part of the case. Uh, let me minimize this, hold on. Oh, cool. So if I go to this face, uh, I created this cutout. Let me start from the beginning. So I started pretty much creating like a geometry um, based off the center of the uh, Raspberry Pi. Uh, if I go, uh, all right, still learning here. You're all right. It looks like you imported the Raspberry Pi from somewhere and then you're able to- Yeah, it. so about, the, yeah. So I, I started from the center here mm -hmm. and then built a geometry around it, kind of a box geometry. Yeah. Uh, and then, um, yeah, so if I, yeah, this was, okay, that's not working too well. I see the lip that you created, so they click together. Yeah, yeah, so there's a clip that comes out of the holes right here. And uh, if I can go to the other side, uh, I just did a, a mirror. Once I created one of those holes, hmm. I got that onto the other side, so I cut out from uh, this end, uh, this end, and then uh, the back end here uh, for the SD card. And so that's, cool. uh, I was thinking of printing it on the 3D printer, but um, Carrington recommended uh, maybe using the MarkForge instead of the regular 3D printer. Um, it, it, it would be a little more durable after it's printed. Sure. So um, that's that. There was, um, I was interested in <laughs> creating there you go. That's something based move. off of tool uh, imports. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I went, uh, let's see, into a McMaster car where there's like a, a list of a bunch of parts uh, that you can import. I imported this worm gear and this gear here. Uh, I yeah. created a little extension based off of a tutorial and this little handle here. And when you crank it, yeah, you get it moving. That's incredible. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, I was trying to do a simulation of stress strain, but that would have cost extra to get that simulator in here. Mm. Yeah. So, um, you know, I'm still debating whether I want to get that or not. Yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> just <laughs> they break earlier than you want them to. That's the message every time. Yeah, and uh, I tried uh, as far as three D printing. I tried uh, creating something on the resin printer. Uh, something that caught my eye on Thingiverse. Uh, he's uh, I don't know if anybody recognizes it or the figure. Uh, but this is what I came out with. Let me switch back. Hold on. Uh, stop sharing. So everybody see me again? Yep. All right. So this <laughs> is, is that, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> yeah. Is that Bernie? So, uh, it's Bernie. It's definitely <laughs> Bernie. <Yeah. laughs> So, Very timely. Yeah. So 16 minutes of fame. So yeah, that's that's what I got done this week. That's how did you that's... make the gear? That was so like intricate. Uh I just imported the gear. Uh let me share again. Yeah, I, I imported the gear. And uh hold on. Yeah, that's a really great trick yeah, so, in so, so, Fusion. Yeah, you go to McMaster Car here. And then oh, you can type cool. in. I saw that, but yeah. I didn't play with it. Yeah, so there's, there's nice. a whole bunch of parts on here. So oh, very cool. Yeah, if you want to try that out, you know. It's, it's a whole number of steps to like get it imported and not every single part from McMaster has a geometry, but a lot of them do. It's, it's pretty magical, like how much stuff you can just lift right out of the McMaster library. And it's totally yeah. intended for that. 
Yeah. Oh, that's pretty oh, sweet. Cool. Thanks for showing me that. That yeah. kind of inspired me to check it out. Um, All right, Jamie, you want to share? Yeah. Um, Great job, Wagata. Jamie, want to get Yeah. Um, so I just really focused on learning the program. Uh, I did all of your tutorials. I did um, one on making a hinge and just projecting different planes. Um, and then once I felt I got down, I started playing, um, just exploring different tools that I hadn't touched and having fun. So this is my ridiculous playground. Um, and then I, you know, I want to learn more about, you know, joinery. And I was really interested in that. Um, uh, I forget what it was called. This, um, there's an embedded like square nut you put in there. Oh yeah. I call kind it, of, yeah. I call it trap nut, but there's no reason. Yeah. Like it's very contentious what that one's called. Um, so yeah, I did that, um, and that was really a cool way of also just learning the program. Um, and then uh, I 3D printed a phone stand. I, I was meaning to 3D print a few more things this week, but I'll end up doing it probably next week or um, on the wildcard week maybe. Um, didn't work that well for the phone. I was going to use it. So I use it now for, uh, air plants that someone gave me for Christmas. Um, and then for like my custom project, when I started feeling more confident, I, um, I'm starting to design furniture for my van. And the first thing I need to build is something to protect my heater. Um, cause it's pretty exposed right now. So I want to encase it. Um, plus I just need more storage and a place to stand and work. And so I'm developing just this cabinet system. Um, and, oh, I'm not sharing the screen, am I? No, uh, you're not. No, you've been, um, you've I'm been really, telling I'm us like, all those I'm cool clicking through did. this. <laughs> and, um, really sorry, folks. Hold on. I'm not used to doing this. Um, you're all right. Okay. Well, here's what I'm working on now. It's, uh, can you see that? Yeah. So I have like a hidden compartment. And so I broke that there. So, and now I'm trying to put in like drawers and doors. Um, and this is just kind of the heater. So I measured out the exact heater and the, um, the heater needs a specific clearance. So I use lines and different things to make sure that, you know, there's four inches on all sides and above. Um, and then, you know, use this to like put in a bunch of parameters that I need. And it was really just useful, useful. And then I've done other things like, this was what I was talking about in terms of playing around. This opens. Um, just playing, you know, like yeah. not doing anything that makes any real sense, um, but was fun. Um, and over here, <clears throat> the, the lock nut, um, here's the, the box with the, um, the hinge built in oh, and the yeah. lip. Um, so, I mean, a lot of this might not be exciting, but to me, it's just exciting because 3D printing is like, this program was really hard and to just go through all the tutorials and struggle with it and have to like having to have to think differently about um, tolerances and stuff like that. Oh doesn't seem to be there but it didn't break it is there yeah um, so yeah um that's kind of what i did and yeah right now i'm just working on my cabinet system the end well that box there's a way you can simulate it to open and close uh if you're yeah. to if you're to fix it about the axis if you're just kind of stack it on top of each other mm -hmm. i don't know if you're interested in that but 
Uh, no, excellent. I am. I, I've been wanting to figure out how to do like simulations and to do like, um, I was hoping to make a video mm -hmm. of the construction, um, but I just- Oh, oh well, well that part, yeah. yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, the, the actual construction, a video of the construction, but- uh, Yeah, but yeah, the simulation but... too, I'd really, I'd like to do. I, I felt like there wasn't enough time in the week and uh, yeah. I checked out a few tutorials, but they weren't that clear. So I, I don't know if anyone knows of any good toots out there, I'm totally interested. Yeah, there's that was a ton of work. You really worked hard on these past two weeks to get to get through there. This three D three D design stuff. It's not an intuitive software for a lot of people. So that was great work. That's awesome. All right, next up, who wants to share? Da, da, da. Show and tell. Let's see. I don't um I don't have anything to show for it right now. Uh, sure. But yesterday, uh, a few things were sort of dabbled with. Um, Corey aided me in starting to print the stand for my sous vide machine, which I'm like super excited about. Uh, I'm sure I've already said this, but having a tool without a place to put it always feels weird. Like it feels wrong. Um, so, so that's, that's, I'm excited about that. Uh, I was going to make like a little enclosure for, uh, for some sensors, like for, for this upcoming week. But um, what was interesting, we were using the mini 3D printer, like the one just to the left of the, the Prusa, I think is what it's called. And the bed wasn't heating up. So we tried like a few different things and um, short, short story long, uh, it, it, like it wouldn't stay on the bed. It kept like sort of popping out, uh, but it did make some like interesting um, sort of like plastic tags. Like it would never get beyond just the initial layer. Uh, but even that was kind of interesting. Um, and then the last thing that we did was was to play around a little bit in Fusion 360. And I was just playing around with some of the joints. And I, I think what, I, what I've realized is like, A, this could be really valuable for taking a concept and really like boil, boiling it down to like aspects of matter and like geometry. And I, I think that that's kind of cool. Um, I also think it might be really good for me and like uh, sort of like checking myself like, oh, I have this idea. Like, can I boil it down into something actually doable? Or is this just me sort of like running off into the weeds wondering if I can do something? So I think that might be good. And I like that the, the program seems to be very um, sort of like you just like use it and there may be more complex things you can learn as you go, but um, I, I will be using it more for sure. So thank you, Corey, for, for taking the time to give me a little orientation. Yeah, yeah, it's fun. There's, there's good, absolutely. All right, next up, I saw Anna was holding a circuit <laughs> you did a great job with that circuit. Uh, yeah. So I resoldered my thing because it wasn't working. I had to desolder the a rotary encoder, uh, which I spent two hours trying to desolder, and then Corey came in and used the heat gun on it, and I just popped off, which was mildly annoying. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> Oh, I think it was just me sitting there for two hours, like with the copper, uh, not the copper, the um, soldering wick, and just you like. You did get all of the copper off with that solder wick. It was just like the little, the little <laughs> tiny things that go beyond that. Soldering is a subtle art. You totally loosened it. Yep. <laughs> um, didn't have, uh, couldn't get the potentiometer off. Uh, and actually kind of melted it, trying to desolder it. Um, so I had to use another potentiometer that I had to jerry rig on there with Corey's help. And there was like some free floating solders that needed to happen in midair, um, which is part of why it's a little crooked is because this doesn't quite fit here. Get that so it's as like close pushiness. as you can to the camera. I wanna like, it's so like that shouldn't fit there. Yeah, uh, that's with wires that are bent through and like all of the delightful jankiness that you'd, you'd imagine. So like if I turn it around, you could see it pushing through the pins. 
So yeah. that's like a solder point that I had to stick in there. So it didn't quite fit, but we made it fit. Um, so uh, I, th I worked on this today during the snowstorm, uh, made a rainbow, um, basically sequence. But I can't figure out why my yellow, my current problem solving is trying to figure out why my yellow is so dim. Mm -hmm. I have no idea why. Um, I tried a different resistor, as you can see, it's like a little bit bigger than the rest of them. I'm gonna try another resistor and see if I can make it brighter, but the blue and the green are just overpowering everything. And the red and the yellow are just like, boop. Uh, very, very, <laughs> very uh, softly making their presence known. Um, so the idea behind this is ultimately control for different zones of LEDs mm -hmm. um, and create an animation, uh, but not sure. I might have to use different LEDs because I think my yellow ones are just not, they're like the weird generic pack. I don't know if I just need to use another one because it's broken or no idea so um that's what i'm currently doing uh and then uh don't really have a lot of 3d modeling done um really really having a lot of trouble thinking in that that way especially if i can just like pick up a piece of sculpey and make what i want <laughs> which is like really annoying that it's just like we use computers to tell to teach other computers to get what we want when we can just literally just like cut things out of paper and mold things out of clay and get what we want that way and it just um i'm gonna try making something a paper sculpture and scanning it in 3d using a 3d scanner and 3d printing that and seeing how that goes because mm -hmm. i may just need to um do that in order yeah. to understand the 3d modeling um software a little bit better just to see it in in real life like printed uh but that, yeah. yeah that that reminds me and i had intended to say this like off top but tomorrow at 6 p.m a childhood friend of mine is who teaches at smith college 3d modeling and 3d scanning in maya which is like sculpting modeling not the not the sketch and extrude modeling that we've that i do or that that i've been encouraging he is going to we're, we're going to chat for 20 minutes he's got like a canned presentation that he does and so you can stick around and watch his canned presentation and then he i don't know we're just going to chat for an, like up to an hour so if you wanted to talk to him about what it is how does he do it like what are fun 3d scanning technologies He's got the, like, he does this talk a fair amount. So it'll be neat to see what happens at six o'clock. Also, I think I'm, I asked him and I think he's okay with it. We're going to try and expand it out to make it just an event on the Make Haven calendar. And I know it's like a very last minute event, but then if people wanted to come, they could. So. Yeah, that sounds amazing. Um, yeah. I have a friend who does stuff in Blender and I sat with him for a little while. Um, I'm going to need to sit with him for a little while longer because like he went way too fast. He made a furry ball and it felt like he did it in five seconds. Yeah, actually furry things go way faster in Blender. That's like the one thing I know. <laughs> it's like make a sphere and then there's a button you click and it does it. Yeah, so like that was, he was showing me like the quick stuff like, oh, if you want some instant satisfaction, you can do this. And I was just like, oh my God. <laughs> um, but you can't 3D print first, so irrelevant. Yeah. Um, but the ultimate goal is to learn enough about this to, uh, not necessarily for this class, but just in general, a goal would be learn enough 3D modeling software to make a 3D ball, like a 3D, to 3D print a ball jointed doll, which um, mm. is something that I've wanted for a really long time. But like, if you buy them, to buy a good quality ball jointed doll, um, which, come third scale, which like they become, they come huge. I wouldn't get a third scale one, but um, they're like anywhere from 500 to like $2,000. Uh, wow. So being able to 3D print one would basically fulfill like a lifelong 
thing of like, I would love to have all of this disposable income to just spend on this thing that I can design costumes for. Uh, but having a way of doing that to 3D print it, especially if I could use um, the resin printer, like the form lapped printer, then I could make, um, I could make, uh, what do they call them? When you want to cast something, but you need like the, oh. the original. The the like moldable molding basically cast. just like the the not the zeros I don't know what they're called there's a word for yeah. it in, in casting and in molding but basically you make the physical piece that then gets a mold made out of it that you then cast from yeah the like master or the Julia would know yeah. yes Julia yeah. would know I would I need yes. to talk to her she's like the next person I'm on board to talk to about this but um, there's people who do this I, I stumbled across a small community of people who do this because they can't afford the real thing. <laughs> so uh, that's the ultimate goal. I'm nowhere near that yet, but that's like, that's what I'm using as the carrot at the end of the stick. Like if you can figure out a way to understand this, you can make this really cool thing you've wanted your whole life. So yeah, but that's all I got for this week. So a little rainbow for you all. I mean, the rainbow is lovely. <laughs> <laughs> Also check, I'm sure you checked them, but the resistors, just make sure it's not orange, orange, brown, or orange, black, brown, black, orange. Those are the, those are the things, but it's awesome. I'm sure. I mean, I'm using, I'm using 330s for the red, the green, and the blue, and I'm using a 150 for the yellow because the 330 on the yellow made it look like it was off. Oh, weird. That's so weird. Yeah. So the only way I got it to blink was using a different resistor for the yellow one. I'm that after we're done here, I'm pretty yeah. much going to spend the rest of my night trying to figure out why that's happening. Yeah. So. Cool. Uh, I will send along any tips that I can think of. Any who's who's next? We've got Lila and Kate and Ruby. Lila, you're unmuted. Go for it. I can go. I honestly don't have a lot to show you tonight. Um, I've been watching tutorials on Linda and I'm still kind of going back between do I want SolidWorks or do I want Fusion 360, which you would think I would have made a decision by now, but I have not. So what I've done, I've been watching the Linda videos and my goal is there's a little tutorial on how to make like this little video game controller. So my goal is to get through that. And then I was also thinking something simple to just start with. I think I'm gonna design like a little chess piece to print out. So if anyone wants to join me with that, just somewhere to start, that's what I'm gonna do. And then with the um, sensors, that pug face I made had um, distance sensors and also a little photo sensor, uh, light sensor. So I was thinking mm -hmm. maybe I can use that since I already have it and yeah. spend a little more time with the 3D modeling software because I do want to have something to show you. But uh, that's all I have to report today. That sounds that sounds great. Okay. Yeah. The I I those Linda tutorials really seem like a gold mine. Sure. They are. And they like go slow enough where I can pick up something. But I really I don't know. Do I go? So the reason I keep on going back to Fusion 360 is because of that one piece of software you showed us that doesn't have any support to it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I well it so seems you really can, cool. I think you can upload STLs from anywhere. Okay. So you, if you're, if if that's the one hook, I would need to try. Let me try it. I, I can make a note and check that. But I think you can upload an STL, even if you can, if you're exporting it from SolidWorks. What What do you mean for that? Um, for oh, slight... you mean with that that software you it could be any stl and it will work with what you showed us like that thing you made with the bench yes yeah okay. like th this imported it directly from fusion however okay. i think that i think that it will accept stls from just like uploading them so it doesn't have to be a fusion stl which maybe is why they stopped supporting it because it but that's an easy feature for them to have turned off i don't know so i'll check that and then get back to you i just made a note i don't know so my dog is he snoring there he is <laughs> <laughs> there yeah. he is 
You having a good time, buddy? <laughs> hey. <laughs> He's so That's happy. It. He, yeah. lo- he looks bored. <laughs> He's lazy. And it, especially when it's like stormy outside, that's all he does all day. Good for him. How all right. old is he? Uh, two. Oh, yeah. Oh, Anyone never needs a little pet, let me know. He's a good <laughs> cure rapper. Mm-hmm. All right. Next. I like <laughs> Thank you. All right, Ruby, you are, you're next up, I think. Yes. Um, I had a, a, a bad week. Um, Uh-oh. and, but I did, uh, recreate a model of one of my favorite objects. I have, I have a few special useless things and uh, objects that I love. One of them is this little flower vase. Um, I have two of them because I like it so much. Um, I just put my pencils in here and stuff, but anyways. I think that um, I recreated it because I want to uh, make a planter or 3D print a planter in some way. Um, let me move this. Here's my planter. Oh my God. Um, sorry for the noise. My air is very loud and obnoxious. But here it is. I don't know what this is. I, I think I did it by accident. I have to delete it but made it hollow. Um, Yeah, I love it. I think I need to put like holes in the back still and stuff, but um, a big accomplishment for me. Yeah. Uh, And then, oh, did I stop sharing? Yeah. Yep. Um, So next on my list is 3D printing that and uh, getting like, more comfortable with fusion i want to try to make something like i recreated um one of corey's joints that he made uh, that he shared um and that was cool that was riveting exciting uh i think next i want to try to make something on my own without a reference or maybe maybe like a physical reference like Mm. i have like a like a jar that i might make and like the top has a lid with like a lip um, and that seems like a good level of uh, hard hardness. So, what material was used for that holder? Um, I didn't assign it in a material actually. Um, so, as of right now, I think the default is metal. Yeah, I think it's steel by default. So, yeah. Oh, the original. Um, this is ceramic. Oh, that's right. Okay. I don't even know where I got it. It just New House by Jonathan Alder. It has a cute little house with an eye in it. Very <laughs> random. But um nevertheless. It might be uh, cool if you do cool. print that in PLA. Um there's some really cool coating. Um you've probably seen it in the space, the coatings that you can use to smooth it out. Um that I played with a little bit over in the casting area from uh Smooth On. Um I know there's something weird with PLA and water <laughs> over time and oh and wait yeah maybe i shouldn't do that then so but but if you if you coat it i made a toothbrush holder years ago and i coated it in this in the stuff that actually smoothed it out and made it water resistant um so just a note even just like i'm probably bondo would do a reasonable job i had a a rusty car as a as a teen so i was well acquainted with bondo to fix problems. I think that you could do something like that across the surface, but pro- I would say use the stuff that's at the molding space. That's probably better. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. I have to think about this. Because mm-hmm. 3D, the PLA isn't exactly my vibe, you know? It's like very shiny, which is great. Yeah, I'm, I'll think about it. I have lots to think about. What about a wood filler? Don't they have like, uh... Like, can't you 3D print with, um... Oh, a wood. That, like... Yeah, yeah, I heard about that, actually. I'm going to write that down. And Anna, what's up? Uh, so when I was asking people about stuff in 3D print Slack channel, uh, someone told me that the Formlabs printer, you can get a ceramic resin mixture and then cure it in the kiln, and that would give you, essentially, a 3D printed ceramic, because what 
cures off what well, what ends up curing off in the cone is most of the resin. So then it it would be water resistant. It would not have the same limitations. Um, I've been thinking of buying some if you want to go in on it, Ruby, because I want to make eventually make my 3D printed ball jointed doll out of a like a a ceramic resin mixture that you can print with. Oh yeah, let's do that. Mm -hmm. I'm down for that. That sounds really cool. Thank you. That was that was everything. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Makes me want to, makes me think every so often I get this desire to like build a cement 3D printer. Not a giant one, but for like kind of big vases. That would be fun. Uh, same yeah. similar idea. Maybe a metal 3D down. printer too. Ooh, the, that sounds <laughs> laser sintering. Laser I've seen laser sintering. So like I went and visited Shapeways, which is a really expensive way to have things printed. They have a, I think it's in Brooklyn. Um, and you can, they'll like walk you up to the machine and you can watch it do the laser sintering on metal, which is mesmerizing, um, but just very, very God awful expensive. So yeah, out of the question. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. And Kate, what happened? What happened for you this week? Um, I don't, I don't have much to, uh, much to show. I can show the, the little bit that I have mostly this week. I was getting ready for our annual meeting. Um, mm -hmm. so let's see if I can <laughs> stop clicking all the things, share, um, Ooh. share, share, whatever. Is that sharing? Are you seeing some weird fusion stuff? Yep. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so this is my first take on the stool. Um, Corey went, um, talked with me and I, um, unexpectedly made it, um, uh, an outline. I mean, like it's, it's 3D, but it's, awesome. you know, it's, it's more like a plant stand. It's not what I was going for, but it was an interesting learning experience. Um, and then I went back and I had more luck. I realized I was changing the extrusion on this a little bit. So that doesn't look completely solid, but um, I did that. Um, and basically just spent a lot of time playing with Fusion 360. Um, and then I decided to make um, my lava lamp just because I couldn't think of anything and it was in the room. Um, and so I just made sort of playing with the whole tool, made a lava lamp. So that was my, uh, my playtime in, in Fusion this week. I think that lava lamp is actually, you know, like it's a, it's a lovely representative lava lamp. Uh, it was like, when I first saw it, it was so clear what it was. It was like, I, that's a lava lamp. It is. Uh, there's tons of it. just like. When I looked at it, I was like, oh, there's clear shapes that I can figure <laughs> out and I can see the planes and I can try this. You know, it's not like the fox from, you know, clay or anything like that, so. Right, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's totally worth it. If you're ever, you know, if there's another snowstorm and we're stuck inside and can't go anywhere, it's absolutely worth it to grab some like random object that you have and try and model its shape to see, you know, it's just a glass of water, but like to try and, yeah, that the IKEA glass. That's what it is. It's like a quarter. Um, the to like pick a a glass like that and just model it to see. You know, it's not going to be easy, but it's just a thing to practice with. So that's totally that's totally it. There's there's all sorts of exciting things that you can do. Um, Let's see. Oh, so definitely my friend, his name is Andrew Maurer. And tomorrow at 6 p.m., he's going to, I'm going to have a call with him. I'll push out information through the chat. Um, if we wanted to set up something more official, Kate, if you have a plan for that, I'll be fairly accessible tomorrow morning. I've got a little bit more free time in, in my day tomorrow as well. And so we can try and set that up. And then, uh, there are lots of interesting things to, to do and to learn. So I hope that, that there's all sorts of exciting things that go along with 3D modeling and inputs and outputs. Really, really mastering one or two inputs is a good first step on, on the charge to how do you make things respond. It's, it's kind of amazing when you think about in a, in a slightly different context, the very first time that life was able to see, it was only 
algae that could like see if it was light or dark and they would go up or down in the ocean based on the, the amount of light that they could see. And so think about your little Arduino projects. When you're just adding the first sensor, it's just the very first sensation that they can have in the world. And then it goes, it spirals from there. And then you have crazy Arduino projects that are walking around uh, picking up your, your laundry and putting it in the washing machine later. It uh, feels very reason. Maybe we'll have that in a year. Who knows? Folding it. Yeah. Folding it. Yes. I'm oh really my God. Right. It folds things. So a folding robot. Yeah. I'm really yeah. curious. I think like um, I, I'm. I'm really curious about Anna's circuit right now, and like what is happening with it. Like why? Why are the blues so bright? Um, I, even though I they have, have the 330 resistance. Yeah, I want to hear. I, I have a few ideas. So here's my three, my three first thoughts for you, Anna. One is I would, I would say it's surprising that different resistors are, that the same resistor is giving you such different results. Blues are always going to be a little bit brighter, but that's just because they're blues and their forward voltage is a little higher. It shouldn't be much, much brighter. One thing that's gotten me in the... It's much, much brighter. It's much, much brighter. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that's gotten me in the past is that when I'm writing code for something like that, oh yeah, the yellow is so much dimmer. Um, the If you don't declare a pin and output, but you do write it high, sometimes in the code, if that's the case, it'll try and, and write it high, but because it because you didn't write it high, it's it's tricky, and it's actually because there's two. It's weird, but there's two states for there's two properties of each pin. If you really drill drill down inside of an Arduino, there's this one property that's high or low, where you're writing at high or low, and then the other one is try state or not. And try state is when a pin is an input, and then not is when you can use it as an output. And so if you have a pin in its try state, so you didn't say its pin mode was output, and then you write it high, it'll be dimmer like you're seeing. Well, so, I mean, I'm looking, sorry, really quickly. Uh, oh, sorry. I'm looking at my sketch and I have each LED assigned to a pin, which is on. Can we um, see the, can you share your screen with us? Uh, I can't, but uh, it's because I have two computers set up. I can try and flip this around so that you can look at it, but I don't know how well it's going to work. So hold on. It's okay. I no, I mean, I can, I, can, I, can, I can give it a shot. Hold on. Eh, how do I flip this screen? There we go. I don't know how that's going to work. No, I can see things. Yeah, there we go. All right, you set up four outputs. Cool. I'm, so I'm, up here, I can also show you, like I assigned them two different pins and yeah. then I gave them all outputs. And so I just basically have it on a 500 second delay on high and then it's on a 600 second delay for low. And I don't know if that maybe the delay has something to do with it or something. Um, but they all have the, the exact same, like I just copy pasted for each LED. Yeah, yeah. and that. So that code is gonna run exactly how you think it is. Then it makes me think that it's something uh, electrical. Can you show us the LEDs and the resistors? Yep, hold on. Let me flip this around. Well, actually, no, I can just do this. Um, so I'm gonna unplug it so you can actually see it. Hold on. Sure. Uh, all right, so. So this all is right. a 330, that's a 330. What's that the is color code on that guy? 50, which I grabbed from the soldering station. And then that's another 330. Um, what if you, what, flip the 330. So take the resistor that's on yellow and swap it with the one that's on blue. Okay. Because I, I wonder, I'm curious if the resistance value is different. It looked like it was brown, green, brown, something. Yeah. yeah, it's uh, it's brown, green, brown is what that resistor is. Resistor color code. So I'm pulling up a resistor color code. And so I'm switching them. Hold yeah, on. you're good. Sharing this and brown, green, 
brown. Let's say it's gold. Uh, this, it, it looks says, gold. Yeah, if it's not gold, it could have been. There's a number of things that last one could have been. Yep, multimeter by any chance. Or does um, your partner? My partner does, but he is currently on a call, so I can't ask him right now. But I can't when we when we check this this part, the yellow LED. It said that it was. Uh, was it? It said it was um, one point no two point. No, it was one point seven volts for the. It was on diode mode for yeah. the multimeter. So that's probably the forward voltage drop. Yeah. And that's what I was trying to say, and I just couldn't figure out what it was. Yeah, you're good. So that that's like the energy that that LED is going to use, and if it's a forward voltage drop that's significantly less than the other LEDs, it would show up less bright. But by using a lower value resistor, you can usually like cheat your way around it. That's why I was using a 150. So hopefully yeah, like, maybe. Yep. So now I've switched them. So like I've switched the 150 to the blue and the yellow now has a 330. So I'm gonna plug this back in and we're gonna see what happens. So the blue is definitely less bright than it was, but the yellow is still way lower than it was. Hmm. Okay, so that tells me that something about that resistor, there are other numbers of color codes. So okay. like that resistor, we don't know is 150. We think it's 150. That's um, true. If you've got a pile of 330s, what you can do is put two 330 ohm resistors in parallel, and then okay. it cuts the resistance in half, Okay. which is a fun, like that's a, that is an entire physics unit in and of itself if you're taking high school physics. Um, but two it's resistors. A, in ahead, yeah, well. yeah no, I'm, uh, I just wanted to hear that one more time, Corey. That's two resistors. How are they hooked up? Two resistors wired up in parallel will cut the resistance in half. Okay. And, and there's, a, there's an equation that, because like if you think about, um, think about pushing through a filter, right? If you have to push it through one filter, it's not too bad. But if you have to push something through two sequential filters, it's twice as hard. But in this case, you're pushing it through two adjacent filters. So you've got more area you can push through. It would be less hard to push the electricity through it. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's, it it's like an that. interesting, it's interesting. Yeah, I would have said it doubled it, but it doesn't. It, it, it cuts it in half. In series, it doubles. In parallel, it cuts it in half. Can I? Can you draw a schematic? I'm, uh, like, I'm having a hard yeah. time seeing. Yeah, it. give me, give me, give me a second. I'm trying to look Sorry, at, like, actually try and visual. recreate it in my head on the board, not plugging anything in. So. No, you're good. I'm. Um, let me. I'm. I'm share a screen. Do 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 do, do. and. Series parallel resistor. This is like I, um, yeah, and it's okay. So this is this is a very tiny, but the right image. So in parallel would be like this. So they're like next to each other, not in a row. They're they're like adjacent to each other. So stacked. Uh, so if I'm looking at my breadboard, sorry, just because I need a physical, instead mm -hmm. of them being the way they are now, which they are stacked in a column, I would then need to actually put them in a row. Uh, if you you want to have them in holes, don't think of it as a series of hops. Think of it as like two legs hopping beside each other. It's not. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. I'm having such a hard time seeing this from. The schematic. So yeah, in, in relation to a breadboard. So series leg the, to leg to leg. But yep. think about it. Think about it. This is the analogy I used to give in my physics classes, right? If we are all in a gym and there's a fire mm -hmm. drill and we need to leave, if we mm -hmm. have to go through a series of doors, right? If you have to go through one right. doorway, then another doorway, then another doorway, it's kind of hard to get everybody out. But if there's four doors to leave the gym and they all go straight outside, it's way easier because right. all those doors are in parallel. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. But in terms of hooking them up, I'm just trying to see the two legs are coming together and meeting in like the yeah. same in the yes. same hole in the breadboard or the same 
the same, the same like row. connected row same in a connected printboard. Row. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Whereas the others are not; they're jumping to another row. Yeah. But, yeah. So mine's jumping was... from the negative, the negative column to where the the LED is. Yeah, you do two of them that go okay. from the negative to the LED. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then they would just be next to each other on the same line. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. And then the LED would just be in the next one over. Yep, to get itself out and like wired back around, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. I will try that. Yeah. This is, but... this is the, like, maybe unusual, but uh, this was a part of my childhood. My uncle came over at some point and was like, oh, we need to get some resistors and wire them up in parallel for these speakers that we have. This is the sort of strangeness that filled my childhood that probably led to this, to all of this. <laughs> what a wonderful thing to have. Yeah, it was, it was charming and awkward and, and fun. <laughs>